So Edward Tronick is a developmental psychologist uh, at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Um, in the 1970s, he conducted fascinating research um, on the development of infants and children, uh, including what has come to be known as the still face experiment. I'm surprised that uh, I didn't really know about this research until recently. Uh, I'm assuming that um, many mental health professionals uh, have known about his research. Um, I only came to know of it uh, because a patient of mine drew my attention to it. Um, today I want to talk about that experiment and I want to talk about its implications for psychoanalysis and for psychodynamic psychotherapy in general. Uh, Tronic uh, is a research psychologist, but he is also a psychoanalyst. Um, I'm not aware of to what extent or even if he at all um, has commented on or explored the implications of the still face experiment. For, uh, for psychotherapy. He may have, uh, I'm not aware of it, but this is what I want to talk about today. Um, I'm going to put up uh, in the next frame a, um, a link, a hyperlink uh, to an online, a very brief online video uh, illustrating the still face experiment. I find these videos extremely moving uh, because of my interest in the metaphors and myths and signifiers of Christianity. Of course, what comes to my mind here is that this is, this is a depiction of crucifixion followed by resurrection. It's painful to watch the baby fall into despair when mother turns her face away and stops responding. And then it's wonderful to see the baby come back to life again when mother turns her loving face back towards the child. In the still face experiment, mother is instructed to stop responding. That is, to turn away from and deny and fail to exercise her response ability. I've always been interested in that word, responsibility, response ability the ability to respond, the responsibility to respond. Mother sets that aside. Baby falls apart. Mother regains her responsibility. Baby comes to life again. Okay. How is it that in the light of this knowledge, psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, psychoanalysts have somehow for many years fallen into thinking that in order to practice these professions one must somehow or other develop the still face, the poker face, the blank screen, neutrality, non-self-revealing. I mean, that's what mother is doing in this video. 
She's turning away. She is not revealing her face. She's not revealing any response. And somehow psychotherapists have been trained to think that this is what they must learn to do. Now, of course, in his technical papers, Freud wrote about how the analyst must be like a mirror, mirroring back only what is uh, shown to him. Um, he must be, he must uh, adopt uh, an attitude like that of the surgeon, uh, objective. Now, of course, uh, Freud, I think, was speaking metaphorically, and he didn't intend for these metaphors to be taken literally or to be put into practice in some rigid, obsessive way. We know that he himself did not behave that way. The wolf man was hungry, so he gave him herring. Uh, I mean, from the so-called neoclassical standpoint, the neoclassical people being those who took Freud's suggestions and uh, reductively reified them into a set of rigid behaviors, uh, Freud, by that standard, uh, would have failed by the neoclassical standard. He was much more flexible and responsive and self-revealing uh, than the neoclassical uh, mirror surgeon poker face people uh, would like. Many candidates come to analytic training already with this as an ideal in their mind. I'm thinking that some children who play the doctor game uh, may wind up as doctors. What was the game that these poker-faced therapists were playing as children? Playing at the still face, at the cool, calm, objective, and therefore superior person. The, the patient is emotional. The analyst in this view is calm, unperturbed, totally self-controlled, non-self-revealing, inhuman. There is certainly something inhuman about this. In the still face experiment, Mother becomes robotic or dead. Andre Green has written profoundly about the dead mother complex. Not just literally dead, but emotionally dead. In the still face experiment, the mother goes emotionally dead. And we see the baby's soul dying in reaction, and then coming back to life when mother becomes enlivened again. This became an ideal in the minds of many. The poker face, the professional still face, essential for the psychiatrist, the psychologist, the psychoanalyst. Now, of course, there have been many protests against this, many attempts to get beyond this. Uh, certainly the whole field of relational psychoanalysis has in some way meant an effort to overcome this and to understand psychotherapy as a relational process. Self-psychology, the analyst needs to maintain empathic contact and emotional attunement with the patient, but even 
Even there, this is still a professional attitude. It's a professional deployment of empathy. It's a technique. And uh, sometimes patients uh, recognize that their self-psychologically oriented therapists are practicing a technique. And they would prefer that the analyst break rule and display inappropriate anger or inappropriate interest because then they might be able to feel that the analyst is being real instead of cloaking his or her reality behind the mask of technique. Among the relationalists, uh, Eric Fromm is different in this respect. Eric Fromm moved towards an ideal of existential encounter, like Martin Buber, Eric Fromm began to talk about authenticity, being real, being authentic which certainly inevitably must entail self-revelation on the part of the therapist. Now, I'm not advocating wild analysis. I'm not advocating irresponsible exhibitionism on the part of the therapist. Um, I try to be quiet at the beginning of sessions so that I can see what emerges from the patient and I try not to interrupt that prematurely because I want that flow to take place before I weigh in with my questions and my hypotheses, my hypothetical interpretive ideas. Um, but of course I'm revealing myself and I'm much more comfortable revealing myself uh, than many of my colleagues seem to be because that still face has never been an ideal of mine. Um, I've received a lot of criticism from psychoanalytic colleagues for being excessively self-revealing, sometimes for what they have considered inappropriately self-revealing. But I think that psychotherapy is a human relationship. It's at its best, it's an I-thou encounter. Now I don't romanticize this any more than Martin Buber romanticized the I-thou he recognized with the Abrahamic religions that we are fallen, broken, a pure I-thou relationship is not possible for us. We may enjoy it for moments, but then we fall back into the field of the I-it relationship. Uh, I acknowledge all of that. I also feel it's necessary for the analyst to be objective at times. To, in a broad sense, to diagnose the patient. Um, so, certainly, in my view, it's not enough to attune to the subjectivity of the patient. It's not enough to establish empathy with the patient. One also has to be able to confront and to clarify and to interpret. But the still face, the poker face, has become in the minds, I think it's getting better these days because of the critiques of this from self and relational and interpersonal and intersubjective uh, perspectives, it's become better, 
Of course, the problem there is that in challenging this, uh, many of uh, the relational self intersubjective people have gone to the other extreme and have pretty much lost the unconscious in the process. Because, of course, in order to get at the unconscious, a certain amount of quiet listening and receptiveness is important on the part of the therapist. Uh, a certain amount of objectivity. Uh, objectivity in the sense of not signing on entirely to the patient's subjective narrative, but being suspicious of that narrative, being open to the signs of another narrative that slips in through the cracks of the dominant narrative, the slips of the tongue, the dreams, the symptoms which reveal that there is a hidden narrative and it's a major part of the analytic task to bring this hidden narrative to the surface and to do this the analyst has to listen with the third ear as I pointed out in a previous video a self-psychology supervisor was emphasizing to me the need to be empathic and to remain empathic empathic with the patient and and I asked but which patient because of course following Freud and Klein there is no one patient the patient is always at least double the example I gave was the patient who on the manifest conscious level was trying to convince me that the only way I could cure her would be to sleep with her meanwhile she was sending me a lot of other messages latent messages in which she was pleading with me to be a responsible parent to not be seduced to please maintain boundaries so which of these conflicting messages should I be empathic with well of course the answer is with both but that means that at times I am not buying the conscious narrative. I'm suspicious of it. I know there's another narrative. And I'm calling the patient's attention to it. And sometimes the patient doesn't like this. Sometimes this feels highly unempathic to the patient. But that's, that's the job of the analyst to empathize with both narratives. One is revealing something of oneself when one strives to call the patient's attention to the unconscious, to their other self. The analyst is displaying his or her capacity to think otherwise, his or her capacity to resist being drawn in to the surface narrative, the dominant narrative. One is revealing a lot about oneself. One is revealing one's tenacity. One is revealing one's courage. One is revealing one's aggression, one's assertiveness. There are a million subtle ways in which the analyst is continually engaging in self-revelation. It always struck me as amusing that that Freud could say at the end of, I think it, yes, yeah, the end of the Dora case, quotes, if one has eyes to see and ears to hear, one may convince oneself that no mortal can keep a secret. If his lips are silent, he chatters with his fingertips. Betrayal oozes out of him at every pore, unquote. 
That's Freud. Of course, he had the patient in mind. The patient leaks. But of course, the analyst is a human being, and the analyst leaks. And the patient is reading all of this leakage, just as the analyst is reading the patient's leakage, or ought to be. So, it's virtually a delusion to think that one could manage to not be self-revealing. There's an interesting delusion that many analysts seem to have been captured by, the delusion that you could be not self-revealing. Now again, this is not an argument in favor of wild, exhibitionistic, unrestrained self-revelation in which the analyst is taking up the patient's time and space uh, instead of listening and analyzing. Uh, I'm in no way seeking to defend that kind of lack of self-controlled work. But the idealization of the still face errs in the extreme opposite direction, and it seems to be grounded in this delusion. When patients ask you personal questions, should you just answer them? Well, I don't. I say to the patient, um, I think it'll get us further if instead of just answering you, we take some time to explore what you think the answers might be and why it is that you're asking and what you imagine. Um, but if at the end of that, it seems important to you for me to answer, then I'll probably answer your question. But before getting to that, let's, let's, let's see what you suppose, what you imagine. This is this is the way to handle that. Um, but if it is important for the patient to know, I will share that information. At times, um, the patient is going through something in his or her life that I myself have gone through in the past. And sometimes it's quite useful for me to reveal that and to draw on my experience and to share some of that experience. This is not always useful. Sometimes it's contraindicated, but it shouldn't be ruled out. It shouldn't be banned in favor of the ideology of the still face, because sometimes it's therapeutic and useful. Well, you see, I'm interested in being therapeutic, not just analytic. Because, you see, for me, analysis is one way to help facilitate a cure, a healing. I want to heal. And analyzing helps the healing process. But it doesn't replace. It's merely a part of a healing process. Some colleagues seem to have forgotten this. Anyway, I think we can all do well to, from time to time, revisit this little video and ask ourselves, why on earth, why on earth have we idealized this mother who, who turns her face away? in our practice. Is it revenge? Is it identification with the aggressor? Have we all been hurt by this mother? This dead mother? And do we have a need to play dead mother to our patients? Because our mothers turned her face, their faces away from us, do we have to turn our face away from our patients? What are we doing? 
calling this psychotherapy? Is it really an unconscious enactment in which the roles are reversed? Instead of being the victim of the dead mother, I am now the dead mother and my patients are my victims?